Hey, my name's Traven and you saw the title. Today, I'm gonna ramble about my top things of spring 2019. Rules are pretty self-explanatory. The things I talk about must have come out in the last few months and I have to have, well, watched, played, or etc. them. Though a lot of the stuff I watched, played, and etc. recently have been sequels and continuations, and rather than fill the video with discussions that essentially amount to, it's more of what I liked, or it's not more of what I liked, I thought it'd be fun to blast through them with a new segment I like to call... Hey, remember those high schoolers getting home bothered about games of chance in a prestigious high school whose social hierarchy is built around gambling? Did you like the ridiculous faces, camera spittle, obsessive fetishism, jazzy soundtrack, and horrible people getting their comeuppance? Good, because the second season is just more of that, but now it's a TOURNAMENT! While there are some moments that come and go a bit too quickly, this season builds upon its characters' relationships and their respective growth in creative and emotionally impactful ways. The play into the heartwarming core of the series' narrative about self-improvement and the power of empathy. And even better, its animation hits it out of the park with some absolutely amazing cuts. Which I actually made a whole video about recently, so check that out maybe and you'll like it, I think it's good. The first episode is a slow burn that establishes some interesting narrative threads that quickly escalates toward a brutal climactic cliffhanger that I'm sure leads to a violently entertaining drama I'd enjoy if I bothered to finish it. I don't know what it is, I just kind of lost interest in the show, and while I'm sure my curiosity will force me to get around to it eventually, for now, I don't really have any strong feelings one way or the other about it. It's good! Until it isn't. It hits the ground running with some strong cinematography and characterization, fascinating world building, better pacing, and of course, some incredible action. But then it stumbles back into a lot of the trappings that bogged down volumes 4 and 5. Static action, weird pacing, and several rushed plot threads that make me think the show was trying to wrap things up just a bit too quickly. Granted, I don't think volume 6 is as flawed as some people make it out to be, but it's still quite a mixed bag of a season. It's more of that quirky stylization and satirical tone I found so charming from the previous two seasons. But whose cartoonishly exaggerated plot builds toward a dramatic and emotionally fueled finale that I think wraps up its story quite nicely. Of course, I say this as someone who never managed to finish the original book series and I'm not sure how it compares as an adaptation, but still. Now, with that out of the way... Russian Doll is a Groundhog Day style series about a woman who finds herself reliving the same night in an endless loop every time she dies. This show kinda came out of nowhere for me, but seeing how short it was, only 8 half ish hour episodes, I decided to give it a chance and was quite surprised by how much I ended up enjoying it. The show has some cool direction and got downright nightmarish at times, and was chock full of painfully dark and blunt humour while its characters' eccentric personalities and respective emotional issues bounce off each other quite well. The main character, Nadia, a middle-aged computer programmer with dry wit and a no-bullshit approach to life, played by Natasha Lyonne, who also co-created the series, is especially fun to watch. Thank God he started cooking on Thursday. Thursday. What a cancer. I particularly enjoyed the way the series uses its premise. I don't want to spoil too much, but there's a strong focus on the character's frustration with the monotony of it all. Stuck living the same routine over and over again, and how different characters at different stages of life cope with that repetition. And for me personally, there's something about how that ties into their respective mental and emotional troubles that struck a chord with me. As someone who has and still is dealing with severe mental issues, it can often feel like I'm stuck in my own loop, dealing with the same thoughts and anxieties over and over again, chasing a white bunny down a spiraling rabbit hole with no end in sight. It's a feeling I haven't seen portrayed much anywhere else, and one I think the series captures pretty well. And for as hard as it might be to deal with, it also shines a light on the end of the tunnel, with the characters slowly opening up about and confronting their demons, and finding the strength to support each other through their own battles, with a nice message about how we can't help anyone else until we've helped ourselves. It's a cool series whose characters I couldn't help but connect with. Promised Neverland is a slice-of-life adventure about Emma, Ray, and Norman, a trio of best friends growing up in a countryside orphanage run by Mother Isabella that follows their misadventurous lives as they learn some important lessons about family, friendship, and- OH GOD NO WHY EVERY FUCKING t 
time! Based on the manga of the same name, The Promised Neverland follows these kids as they realize their orphanage is actually a farm run by demons who feed on humans, and their efforts to escape before it's too late. And I will admit, at first I was quite hesitant about this show and the amount of hype I'd seen surrounding it, since the last time I let myself get excited for a dark fantasy based on a popular manga I was not familiar with, I got overhyped, and when it failed to meet my unbelievable expectations was utterly disappointed, to the point of being a salty little shit about it. But The Promised Neverland was quick to catch my attention. The moment that completely sold me on the show was from the end of episode 1. It's the one key anime by Ken Yamamoto that introduces us and the children to the truth. The children's reactions are so well rendered and the demon's movements are so grotesquely fluid that even on repeat viewings, I still get a little bit nauseous. It's a beautifully macabre scene, and it's just one example of how the show establishes and maintains a strong atmosphere throughout its run through its art direction, which while varying in quality a bit, effectively instills this overwhelming sense of dread with a variety of tricks and techniques that give one a creeping feeling that someone is keeping a close eye on their every move. It all works to emphasize how trapped these children are in this place they'd known as home, and the pure terror of realizing that there might not be a way out of this oppressive system. And yet, the children forge ahead anyway, doing everything in their power to devise a plan that'll get them all to safety. It leads to a game of cat and mouse as the children try to work around every obstacle Isabella throws their way, creating a plot full of twists and turns that had the table spinning out of control. The sheer momentum of the show's pacing alone had me desperate to see what happened next. Which the cliffhanger endings did not help. Ah, oh, come on! For all the fear that permeates the show, its biggest strength comes from the multi-dimensional mind games between its main cast. It's a horror thriller that easily hooked me in from the get-go. Meanwhile, on the opposite side of the mind game spectrum, Kaguya-sama Love is War follows Miyuki Shirogane and Kaguya Shinomiya, the president and vice president respectively of the student council of a well-to-do high school who are desperately in love with each other. But because of their respective egos, neither wants to be the first to admit it, and so they concoct all sorts of elaborate schemes to try and get the other to confess their feelings first. And it gets a surprising amount of mileage out of its premise, with every episode managing to find some new ridiculous set of circumstances for them to work with. And as more characters are introduced, it creates even more chaos as they end up in one way or another, throwing a wrench into Kagi and Miyuki's carefully laid out plans, whether it be Chika's childlike naivety or Ishigami's pessimistic and unattentive ramblings. It uses its characters under growing chemistry for some great comedy. This is all bolstered by the show's art. Its stylish presentation leans into more absurd and striking visuals, that not only looked great in their own, but which also amplified the ridiculousness of the scene at hand. Also, the ED for episode 3 is fucking amazing. It was animated by Naoko Nakayama, and the dance was choreographed by Nagisa Sugao, and is what originally made me check out Kaguya-sama in the first place. It's honestly worth checking out by itself. Overall, it's a cute and funny show that, surprisingly, teaches us some valuable lessons. Love, Death and Robots is an anthology of animated adult shorts from a bunch of studios and directors that range from crude comedies to gorso horrors. It's a fantastic showcase of all kinds of different animation styles and techniques that's great to see, especially when they can get more experimental and extreme with the kinds of stories they explore, thanks to that mature label. And with the amount it offers, I could probably dedicate a whole video to just breaking them down individually if I wanted to. Granted, my enjoyment tended to vary from short to short, as is to be expected with any sort of anthology, but I still found quite a lot to appreciate even in the ones I didn't like as much. But there's a big part of me that can't help but feel like it gets a bit repetitive at times. A lot of the shorts use realistic 3D, which, while an impressive technical feat, and one that's used to great effect in many of them, gets monotonous after a while. I wish there'd been a bit more overall aesthetic diversity. And there were a lot of shorts that, ironically, almost felt immature, where the idea of adult animation seems more like an excuse to cram in as much blood, swears, boobs, and dick jokes as possible. Don't worry, you wanna see some pussy? Of course, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, and many of the shorts are great specifically because of how over the top they get. But for me, it just got boring to see the same approach being taken over and over again. Overall though, it's a great experiment in mature animation with enough variety for anyone of the appropriate age to find something they can enjoy. Though, fair warning for anyone who may be more sensitive to the topic, a good few of the early shorts revolve around sexual assault in some way, so be wary. Yes. 
This remake of the 1998 classic follows Leon S. Kennedy, a rookie cop on his first day on the job, and Claire Redfield, a college student looking for her missing brother, as they make their way into Raccoon City, only to find it ravaged by a zombie plague. Given I haven't played the original, I can't comment on how it compares, but as its own game, this remake is a solid experience. It strikes a nice balance with its dark atmosphere and schlock horror tone to both terrify and entertain. The gameplay is heavily focused on puzzle solving, so much so that even the exploration can feel like a puzzle box in its own right, when it presents the player a variety of options to solve and that I had a lot of fun figuring out. It's almost addictive, and the way it's structured gives it a nice sense of progression and momentum, especially in the police station, whose very layout has a nice loop that, while at first I was petrified to navigate, eventually gave it all an odd sense of tacticality as every run I took through it turned into a game of efficiency, a skill which is brought to its limit in the game's many bonus modes. But for me, there's one aspect of the experience that loomed head and shoulders above the rest. Everything about Mr. X is genuinely terrifying, from his design to his size and speed to the way his footsteps echo down the halls, and the awareness that he is hunting me down no matter where I go. It adds that extra level of urgency and tension to every in-game decision. The only thing that'd be scarier is if there was two of them. <laughs> oh god. And with rumors floating around that a remake for Resident Evil 3, a game built around a Mr. X-like mechanic is in the works, I could not be more excited. The only real issue I have is that the boss fights are a bit lackluster and some were frustratingly clunky. Overall, it's a solid game that makes the most of the player's ever-expanding knowledge of its mechanics and world. Core Groove is a turn-based tactics game whose story follows the warrior princess of the Cherry Stone Kingdom who, after the assassination of her father, goes on an adventure across the continent of Orania with an ever-growing band of allies to seek help in defeating the undead Felheim Legion. And it's a game I both love and hate in equal measure. On the one hand, I absolutely adore its artwork. It's bright, vibrant, and cartoony with a lot of attention paid to the little details of the environment and the sprites in their animations that make them feel that much more alive. I especially love Nuru's sprite, it's just so expressive and full of colour. There's even a 2D intro for the game with some fantastic animation. Its visuals are well polished and incredibly charming. On the other hand, it's a fucking nightmare to play. It's like it's trying to make me think or something. What is this, a strategy? Oh, wait. As you might have guessed, I'm not the biggest fan of strategy games. A lot of my preferences lean towards the sort of moment-to-moment -moment gameplay of platformers and action games, rather than the long-term planning of something like this. But for as frustrating as it's been to get used to, I've still gotten quite a lot of enjoyment out of it. It's kind of calming to play something with this slower pace, and my ego sure loves it when I manage to piece together plans other than brute force that bring me to victory, even if it was by accident. Despite the difficulties I've had adjusting my gamer brain for it, Wargroove's been a pretty damn great experience, one I'm sure that, if you actually are a fan of turn-based strategy games, will be a fun ride. <laughs> This video explores the thematic undercurrents of The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, and is a fascinating exploration of the hidden meanings woven into its world and narrative. But what I find more praiseworthy is the effort that's gone into its creation. From the collaborative effort that brought it together to the extraneous edits, effects, and graphics that transform it from a simple analysis to an artistic experience in and of itself. It's something I quite appreciate, as I often feel it's rare to find videos that make full use of the medium for their content. Something that feels like it could be especially useful for these sorts of analytical discussions. And with this being the first in a series of videos on The Legend of Zelda games, there's only more room to grow, and I can't wait to see where it goes next. Like Love, Death and Robots, this is also an anthology of animated short films by various creators. But this one, run by Pixar, is a more wholesome version of it. Unless you think mild swearing is a problem. I say we go for it, and if finance doesn't like it, they can kiss our ass! While I do worry about these shorts ultimately leaning into a very particular aesthetic, what's been made so far has shown a lot of creativity and experimentation both technically and narratively. There's one in particular I'm quite fond of called Kitbull, a 2D animated short about an abandoned kitten becoming friends with a pit bull that is both adorable and heartbreaking. It's a great set of shorts I think are worth watching, and honestly, any excuse to see people fiddle around with the medium is more than welcome in my book. And yeah, those are my thoughts. 
It was a bit of a struggle to get this one out, been quite busy recently, which is not helped by the big project I'm working on for the end of April that I am both excited and terrified about. But goddammit, I'm gonna maintain some sort of consistent format on this channel if it kills me. Anyway, tell me what you think. If you agree, disagree, why your favorite stuff from spring 2019 was, why you're excited about for summer, etc. And thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this and want to see more, check out my last few videos. Either on the way the Mob Psycho 100 uses its animation to enhance its story, or on the importance of the most common word in the English language. Lexicon. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. You can follow me on Twitter for more updates on this channel and other stuff, and hopefully, I'll see you later.